Well, honestly, guys, like, this is not how I pictured it happening. <laughs> you know, like, all day today, I was, like, psyching myself up for, like, being in Havener in, like, the big room. Like, yeah, this is going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And then I get there, and, like, it's, like, pitch black, and they're like, we're going to do it at the men's house. I'm like, this is going to be fun. <laughs> But honestly, guys, like, this kind of reminds me, it's kind of cool of kind of getting a New Testament feel of, like, people packed in. And honestly, it's kind of a really cool atmosphere if you think about it. Like, I uh, remember the story, there's a story in the New Testament of Jesus is teaching in this house, and the people are so packed in, and there's this paralyzed man that just wants to get in and see Jesus, and his friends want him to get in and see Jesus, but the house is so packed that they have to climb up on the roof and basically dig a hole in the roof to like lower him down like in front of Jesus. And this is really cool because like we've got a packed out house tonight. And so like maybe we can kind of learn from this of like, wow, like we are together, we are a body of believers. And honestly, I think it's a really awesome opportunity to experience. So the sermon, the title of the sermon tonight is I Won't Back Down. And I don't know if any of you know the song by Tom Petty, I Won't Back Down. I was really trying to find a song because of the whole One Hit Wonders theme. And I'm like, man, I got to find a good song, got to find a good song. And I was sitting with Mariah in Starbucks and we were like going through her like oldies playlist. I'm like, man, got to find a song. And we came on this song, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. I mean, it's awesome. I'm just going to read it for you really quick. It says, well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground. I won't be turned around. And I'll keep this world from dragging me down. Going to stand my ground, and I won't back down. Hey, baby, there ain't no easy way out. Hey, I will stand my ground, and I won't back down. I know that's right. I got just one life in a world that keeps pushing me around. I'm going to stand my ground, and I won't back down. I just thought that was so awesome, and it's such a cool anthem. But so this song was written, actually, in Tom Petty's life right after an arsonist had burned down his home in May of 1987. So he had just had his home burned to the ground by someone who wished him ill. And he is basically like, wow, um, I have lost everything. Thankfully, his wife and children were OK. But um, I love it because he refused to give up. And he insisted on rebuilding his home on the same foundation upon which his original house was burned down. So he takes on this, this um, project of rebuilding his house after it had burn, been burned down. And just as Tom Petty decided to rebuild the, house, uh, the walls of his home, we're going to look into how the walls of the early church were built, metaphorically speaking. So the book that we're going to be going over tonight is the book of Titus. Titus uh, was a letter written from Paul, the Apostle Paul, to his disciple Titus in, on the island of Crete. And Titus was a very dear disciple of Paul. In fact, in the first chapter of Titus, Paul refers to Titus as his true child in the faith. Titus had spent a lot of time with Paul. Titus had gone on missionary journeys with Paul. When Paul traveled to Jerusalem for like this big gathering of the church, Titus was with Paul. And Titus wasn't that old. Titus was probably around our age. He was pretty young. And yet Paul had raised him up in the faith and had given him this big assignment. Um, in this letter, Paul is talking to Titus, and Titus had been given the assignment of establishing the church in Crete. And when you, if you first hear about that, it's like, okay, yeah, he was, he was given a church, like he had to church plant in Crete. And this letter like has a list of qualifications for elders and things. But let me tell you something about Crete. In uh, Titus chapter 1, 
starting in verse 12, it says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own. So this is like actually a Cretan. He grew up in Crete. It says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony, I know, pretty funny, right? Like someone of your own grew up around you is like, yeah, you guys are like liars and beasts and lazy gluttons. It's great. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of the people who turn them away from the truth. So Titus, this young guy around our age, was given this assignment by his discipler, by Paul, and it's in Crete. And Titus is like, of all places, of all places to be, it had to be Crete. So culturally, Cretans were seemingly predisposed to be lazy liars, essentially is what the passage is saying. And Titus is given the task of finding among these people a remnant that is holy and capable of leading a church. It's kind of crazy, right? And so it goes, the letter goes into, and there are these qualifications listed. And these are the qualifications that Paul gave Titus to find a group of men that were capable of leading a church. Starting in verse 5, chapter 1, it says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I have directed you. If anyone is above reproach, husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to ch any charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward, steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but he must be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also rebuke those who contradict it. So this is crazy, right? Like, Titus is like, okay, Starting out, got to find some elders, got to find some guys who are capable of leading. And then Paul gives him these like crazy qualifications of like, oh man, like they have to be not arrogant. They can't be quick tempered. They can't be drunkards. They can't be violent. They can't be greedy for gain. Like they have to be hospitable and all these things. Well, and especially considering like the people that he was among, this was going to be extremely hard. So part of me wonders if Titus maybe would have rather left well enough alone and maybe not gotten this list of qualifications from Paul because now he's thinking, oh great, like now my job is 10 times harder. So he had to find Cretans to fulfill this. And so we're going to read, oh, we already read that, never mind. <laughs> I'm going to make a pretty bold statement here. Now that we've gone over, like, all these qualifications, now that we've gone over, like, how the Cretans were, in all honesty, guys, just as the Cretans were, so are we. Do we not exist in a culture where deceit and laziness run rampant? Unfaithfulness is a norm, and selfish ambition is expected. So what do these qualifications mean for us? Because honestly, guys, we live in a world that's pretty close to Crete. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by it. It's in our lives. It's in our friends' lives. It's in our neighbors' lives. Well, these standards were set for the leaders of the church initially because the leaders were supposed to be the role models of the church. So the church was supposed to do these things as the leaders did them. So these things were setting the standard. These qualifications were setting the standard for the church. Guys, who's the church? We're the church. Right. 
We're the church. So who are these qualifications really for? They're for us. Because as the future church, we were supposed to take on these qualifications. And we're supposed to take on these characteristics because our original leaders were called to this level. And so are we. We are supposed to be what the church was going to become set by the standards of these leaders. So when we look back on this list, I want you guys to like take a little inward look, okay? Because when we first read things in the Bible, sometimes like we see these words and we're like, whoa, like that's a little bit too extreme for me. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm like that. Like, I'm, I'm not that bad. Well, guys, let's see here. So he must not be arrogant. Have any of you guys ever been guilty of being arrogant? Yeah, I can say I have. Um, uh, let's see, arrogance. Holding yourself above other people, judging other people, thinking that you're better than other people. I can honestly say, yes, I have done that. And I'm not proud of it. But I am definitely guilty of being arrogant at times, holding myself above other people. I mean, we even hold, the, we hold ourselves above even our brothers and sisters in the faith. It's crazy, right? We put each other down to bring ourselves up. Are you, have you ever been quick-tempered? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I can say I'm guilty of that one too. Um, uh, my family can attest to that. My husband can attest to that. Sometimes he'll say something and I like immediately am like, that offended my soul. <laughs> <laughs> And he knows that it's true. <laughs> but I, I have this like quick temper that's all of a sudden like, I'm offended and I must defend myself. But guys, like I, I really need to work to control that. I really do. Because in that quick response, in that quick jab, in that sudden, uh, sudden um, hurtness that I get, I in turn end up hurting the people around me. And you can jab the people around you. That's why Paul was like, yeah, our leaders need to emulate this and our church members need to emulate this because this is destructive to the body of Christ. This is destructive to the church. The next one is a drunkard. And I don't think this necessarily has to apply to alcohol. It definitely does. But I think it also applies to any type of overindulgence. So, like, have you guys ever overindulged in something? Something that brings you, like, fleshly pleasure. That overindulgence is hurtful to the church because you end up idolizing those things above your brothers and sisters and above the standards that you're supposed to have. So, like, have you ever, ever overindulged, say... My issue in high school was I overindulged in fiction novels. That was like my guilty pleasure. Like any, like Lord of the Rings, um, The Inheritance Chronicles. Like I loved things with dragons. I know I'm a nerd, and my husband reminds me of this daily. But I. I loved, I loved getting lost in that world because it was just so full of adventure and so full of everything that my life like didn't really have, like dragons and elves and magic and things like that. <laughs> but you know what I did? I overindulged in that and I got lost in it. And I began to prefer that over time with my family. And I began to prefer that over time with my friends. And it was my motivation like, oh, I'll go to church so that I can come home and finish reading the last 10 chapters of this book. <laughs> like, oh, I'll finish my schoolwork so that I can finish this book and start the next one because it seems really cool. Like, it became my overindulgence. Honestly, guys, like, it became my drug, which is really weird because, <laughs> like, how can something like books be like that? It can. 
Because as people, like, we tend to overindulge, and we need to avoid that. Says, or violent. I mean, violence, that's definitely one where, like, we're like, oh, I'm not violent. Like, I, I don't, like, go out and punch people every day, right? Like, I'm not violent. But how many times have you been in the car sitting at a stop sign and someone, like, goes when it's your turn and you're like, oh, girl. <laughs> It was my turn. Well, you know what? Like slandering that person in your heart, that does not breed a good attitude from yourself to others at all. And then the last one is greedy for gain. That's definitely a touchy one because we live in a culture that is controlled by capitalism and individualism, and furthering yourself, and making sure that you're in the best place in life. And it's very, very easy to become greedy, to hoard things, to hoard your money, to hoard your possessions. Maybe even think of like social greediness. Like you have a friend who has another friend, and you're jealous of them because this friend gives more attention to the other one. Like it's Greed can apply to so many different things. The next list is honestly maybe a bit more convicting to me. So the first one is hospitable. And hospitality, a lot of times we don't realize, but hospitality is actually a biblical commandment. Inviting people into your lives to share in your life and to share in your life experiences and saying, yes, you are welcome here. I can definitely say that my mother is very good at hospitality. She is gifted <laughs> at hospitality. I can remember so many times growing up where my mom would just welcome people into our home and make them feel welcome and make them feel like a part of the family. And guys, that's life changing. Honestly, it's probably one of the most powerful tools we have as the church to invite people into our homes and make them feel like they are family and they are a part with us. And guys, we neglect it so much because we become greedy. We become greedy with our time. We become greedy with our space. We become greedy with what we do. Like, you need to, it's a discipline. You need to invite people in and make them feel welcome. Lover of good. You must be lovers of good. It means that you delight in things that are good. I mean, I think a lot of the times we find our delight like in selfish pleasures, in um, indulging in ourselves and overindulgence, but like finding your delight in what is good and what is right and what is holy. Finding your, your joy in serving your brothers and sisters. Finding your joy in reading the scriptures. Finding your joy in prayer with God. Like, delighting in what is good. And the last one that I'm going to cover here is self-controlled. Because I think definitely one thing that we struggle with a lot is self-control. I know I do. Um, when you're scrolling through social media and you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and you know you need to do homework but you keep scrolling and scrolling and you know that you need to talk to this person but you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Guys, that's an issue of self-control. Like you have, to, you have to be self-aware enough to realize that like, hey, this is not beneficial for me and this is not beneficial for the people around me so maybe I should put limitations on this. And maybe I should have some self-control in this area. Or like maybe, maybe you struggle with self-control in eating. Maybe, maybe that's something you go to for whenever you're stressed, whenever you're tired, whenever you've experienced something bad. Maybe you need to practice self-control in procrastination. I know that several people struggle with procrastination. I struggle with procrastination. We really need to learn how to get that under control because you know what that does? When you procrastinate and you end up 
spending, like staying up until four in the morning doing homework, are you a very good witness the next day? No. And then when the afternoon comes and you have free time, do you, uh, are you a good witness and do you um, invest in time with people and invite people into your space? Probably not because you want to take a nap, right? Yeah, you need to have some self-control so that you can reach out to people. So the next point that I'm going to go over is be ready. For this, I'm going to read chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us and redeemed us from all lawlessness to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Guys, once we start putting these things into practice, once we start learning self-control, and once we start um, implementing these things into our lives, I just want you to hear these words. Be ready. Because two things are going to happen. One, you're going to be attacked. And two, God is going to call you. One of my professors recently, um, I went to a retreat, Fall Region Retreat, shout out, really awesome retreat. But Randy Garris, the speaker there, was one of my former professors, and he gave this analogy that just really resonated with me. It was an analogy of two cities, one with walls and one without walls. They both wanted the same things. They wanted peace harmony, and happiness, but only one of them was able to achieve this. The city with walls was able to defend the things that it valued. The city without walls was left defenseless, open to attack by its enemies of greed, selfishness, and sloth, aka laziness. Are you a city with walls or without walls? Because I'm sure, I'm sure that you guys want all of these things. I mean, you want to be self-controlled. You want to have peace. You want to have joy. You want to be able to be hospitable. And you want to be able to reach out to people. But guys, if you're a city without walls, you're going to get stormed. You're going to get attacked. And these, these enemies, these enemies of greed and selfishness and laziness are going to come in and they're going to steal these values that you had of peace and harmony and self-control. you got to build those walls. Now you're probably asking, like, how do I have walls? How do I build walls around my city? Well, you build them with the things that we mentioned before. You build them with self-control with discipline, with love, with mercy. As you slowly begin to implement these things into your life, the walls of your city will be built, will be constructed. But the first warning, guys, you'll be attacked. Once you start building your walls, you're going to be attacked. Because these enemies of selfishness and greed and laziness they will fear being cast out of your life, being cast out of your city. So it's going to get even harder once you start building the walls, I promise you. But guys, it's so worth it to endure. It's so worth it to continue to implement and continue to build those walls. Because if you start now at this stage in your life, in the future, you're going to be able to protect things. You're going to be able to protect your values. You're going to be able to protect your future spouse. You're going to be able to protect 
your family. You're going to be able to protect your life and protect your church because you have walls and you can defend yourself. The second one is be ready for God's call. Because guys, when you, when you start to build walls and you start to cast these things out of your life, you're going to become more attuned to the Spirit. Because God's voice isn't going to be drowned out by all of these things. It isn't going to be drowned out by the static of, of laziness. It isn't going to be drowned out by the static of all of these sins. And you are going to start to feel the Spirit moving you. And it's going to tell you to do some things. I want to tell you that um, he may urge you to speak to someone that you've never spoken to, to before. He may tell you to go somewhere that you haven't been before. And he most certainly will ask you to leave your comfort zone. Because it's only outside of our comfort zones that we really grow. So be ready. Be ready for the call of God once you start to build those walls. Guys, remember, be ready for attack and be ready for the call. The last thing I have to say to you is just circling back around to the beginning. And I want to tell you guys, don't back down. Please, don't back down. Don't let the attacks of your sin get you down. You may be standing at the gates of hell, but don't back down. Keep building your walls and don't turn around. Pursue and be ready. Stand your ground. Don't take the easy way. That's just the world trying to drag you down. Don't back down. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to all people. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this time that you've given us to gather together, Lord, and to, uh, to come together and just to learn about your word with one another, Lord. And I pray that as these people go from this place, that they would remember, that they would remember to build their walls, and that they would remember that their future depends on it. And I pray that as they build those walls, that they would be ready for that attack when it comes, and that they would be able to stand strong, and that they would be able to not back down. Lord, I pray that they would find strength in you and in the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, Lord. You are good, and you are holy. God, we praise you. In your name I pray, amen.